So I'm going to give five lectures and somehow the connecting theme through all of them is going to be descendant integrals, virus hour constraints. And so I thought I'd start with the simplest place, which is for curves. So if you said last week you had uh, surfaces and threefolds, we start here with curves. And the very first part is with the cotangent lines. This is the beginning of um, many of the uh, themes and the subject. And I thought I would start since I have five lectures to start with a relatively careful discussion. So it, it, the first topic will be about deformations. And, oh, I should say that I had sent uh, Andre the link to these slides. So if you want to uh, have access to them, he put them somewhere. Uh, Slack and then we'll drop you a link in the chat. So we start with uh, curves and we're, we're going to consider curves and they're allowed to have uh, nodes, so they're nodal curves. And you can draw them like this if you're an algebraic geometer. Sorry, like this if you're an algebraic geometer or if you like this if you like to think about them actually as topological curves. And for us, the curves will be uh, complex algebraic varieties of dimension one. And when I say nodal, I always mean at worst nodal. That means that a nodal curve may be non-singular and the node looks like this. So this should be relatively familiar to everyone. So these are our nodal curves and uh, we will assume some, some, some aspects, you know, some kind of uh, notational aspects. Our nodal curves uh, will assume to be connected and uh, complete or projective, but they will not be assumed to be irreducible. They will typically allow it to be reducible. So the, a picture might be something like this. That's a possibly reducible, connected, complete nodal curve. And uh, we will start with some basics about the deformation theory. And I'm, it's not my goal here to give some exhaustive treatment of the deformation theory for curves or nodal curves, which is not incredibly hard, but still would take some time. Uh, my goal here is to show you the, uh, the appearance of the cotangent lines or the tangent lines that come in that immediately. It's that you can't resist them. So we start with C, a nodal curve, and then here's our C, and it's a nodal curve, as we said, following the conventions I, I just explained. And if C is non-singular of genus G, this is the uh, easy case, the best behaved case, then it's uh, the deformation theory, the deformations, infinitesimal deformations of C are given by H1 of the tangent bundle. And you can calculate how, how many dimensions H1 of the tangent bundle has using riemann roch and you get this 3G minus three, which is, the moduli, dimension of the moduli, it's a calculation that goes back to Riemann. And uh, what's very important here is that the higher, the H2 is zero. So that these are all unobstructed deformations. So this says this moduli space is smooth with dimension 3G minus three. So that's the case that, uh, well, it's a smooth case and there's no tangent lines there. So the way they, they come up in the discussion of the nodal curves. So if C has nodes, the deformation theory is slightly more complicated to, to describe. You have to, uh, well, it's an X. Actually, the deformation theory is natively always an X. It's kind of an accident, it's an H1 here. Because uh, the scalar differentials is locally free in the non-singular case, but in general, this uh, sheaf of scalar differentials is not locally free. And the actual deformations are given by an X between the Kähler differentials and OC. So that's the deformation space. And again, this X2 is zero. You can check this yourself. And the deformations are again unobstructed. So the deformations of nodal curves are also unobstructed, but still no cotangent lines or tangent lines. So where do they come from? So the deformation theory is gonna be more interesting for a nodal curve because somehow if you have a nodal curve, so here's your curve, it's some nodal curve, the deformations have deformations away from the node, and they also have deformations at the node. The deformations at the node can either preserve the node or smooth the node. And that's where we see the, uh, the tangent lines appearing. So how to say that uh, precisely is here. So nodal curves are more interesting. And, and here I label, I name the nodes, N1, 10 delta, the nodes. And as, we, as I've said before, that the full deformations of this nodal curve are given by this global X, but there is a local to global X, there is a local to global X sequence and I've written it here. 
And on the right hand side, so the global to local X, the local to global X sequence expresses some global X, which is what we're interested in, in terms of some local X. And this global X surge X onto H0 of this uh, sheaf X1. This global X is the deformation space. And as I said, this local to global X sequence has a certain quotient here, which is H0 of this uh, sheaf X. And the sheaf X, since uh, the Kähler differentials are locally free away from the nodes, is actually a skyscraper sheaf supported on the nodes. That's what that sheaf X is. And the main calculation you have to do here is you have to calculate what this sheaf X is. And as I said, it's zero away from the node, so it's a local calculation at the nodes. And one thing that's easy to see is just by you know basic commutative algebra to calculate the sheaf X, as you can easily see that this is a dimension, it's dimension one at every node. That it's, a, it's not only a skyscraper sheaf supported at the node, but it's actually at the node, it's just one copy of C. Uh, so that's easy to do. And then if you do that calculation with some concentration, so the, the question is, what is that copy of C? Like which, which C is it? How to identify that copy of C intrinsically in terms of the geometry of the curve and the calculation that's more interesting to do, and, uh, and as I said, if you want to understand it, one has to really do this oneself, is that uh, this X at C is canonically the, the, the one dimensional space, which is the tensor product of the tangent lines on the two branches of the curve. So if I have this, if I have this nodal curve at the node, there are two complex one dimensional spaces, which are the tangent spaces at the two branches. And this X, is, uh, is the tensor product of these two tangent lines. So this is where the tangent lines appear. So, so somehow, somehow uh, immediately in the deformation theory. So I encourage you to, to do this local calculation for this X and to identify with the tangent lines. And so we have this uh, sequence from the deformation theory of C, that's the X to uh, the sum for every node, there's a there's a map to the tensor product of the tangent lines, and moreover, it's surjective because of this this local to global x sequence is surjective there in this case. And what what is the meaning of this sequence? Is that this x one, this sheaf x one, uh, is about the deformations in the nodes, and if it, and if the global X maps to a zero in the sheaf X1, it means that it's a deformation that preserves the nodes. So one way to interpret this is that the kernel of this map is the deformations which preserve the nodes. So this is, this is really the first occurrence of these tangent lines. And we will see them several times, but this is, it's good to understand this first one. And I thought that since it's a course, we could start at the beginning. So that's basically the foundational discussion here. And it leaves you, the if you want to really understand it, you have to do this crucial local calculation and identify the result with the tensor product of two tangent spaces, which I encourage you to do. Okay, so then we go to moduli. That uh, that if I look at the moduli of curves, that's this non-compact MG, then this is the moduli space of non-singular curves. We've already seen this has dimension three G minus three. And more relevant for us for most of what we are going to discuss is actually the, the compactification by Deline Mumford, which is MG bar. And this allows uh, nodal curves. They have to be connected, as I said, and the uh, canonical bundle should be ample. That's uh, the stability, this Deline Mumford stability. And we can also have points. We can take the moduli space of genus G and pointed non-singular curves. And also there's the compactification MGN bar. And here we consider that when we have some positivity there. Uh, and an element here is it's no, uh, the curve is nodal and connected. And we have N marked points. And these are distinct points, the non-singular locus. And the stability is written here as the canonical, the canonical bundle twisted by these points is ample. OK, so I hope many people have seen some aspects of the moduli space of curves before. The, the point is, uh, says this, the, the compactification is non-singularly reducible. I guess I should also say compact, I already did it there. It's a 
proper to lean Mumford stack, or it's an orbifold if you like that language better. And the dimension is 3G minus 3 plus N. And the, the rigorous treatment of all of this uh, theory of moduli happens in mathematics in the 60s through a combination of different things, but you can say Deline Mumford in the 1960s. But the roots of the ideas are, go back to the 1860s, the Riemann. All right, so we've seen the tangent lines and I wanted to show a little bit how they come up geometrically now. I showed how they appear in the deformation theory. So for every mark point, that's this I, that's the index for one of these N. So this I is one of the N. Uh, for every I, there's a, a line bundle, a complex line bundle determined by the tangent space at the ith point. So if this is the curve, it has an ith point and the ith point has a tangent space, T, C, I. <coughs> And if I put all those tangent spaces together, it gives me a complex line bundle over the moduli space of curves. And I have actually N of them, one for every mark point. And these mark points are never allowed to be the node. So there's never any confusion about what the, what the tangent line is. It's well-defined. So these are, these are line bundles on the moduli space of curves that are, come from the intrinsic geometry of the moduli space. And one way, to, one way they make their appearance, I already said that they made their appearance through the deformation theory. Another way to see that more geometrically perhaps is if I look at the locus of stable curves where for example, I have two, uh, two curves attached at a node. So the left-hand one has genus G1 and, that one, and the right one has genus G2. Then this diagram of attaching two curves at the node can be uh, put together in moduli and giving a map from the low, the two, the two genera on the halves of the curve. You take the Deline Mumford spaces and you attach them. You attach them at the points and make a bigger genus curve. And if you count dimensions, the dimension here will be one more than the sum of these two dimensions. So one thinks of the this map as somehow being a divisor. And it's almost always a divisor, but sometimes it's not, uh, it's not injective. But anyway, this, this map is a co-dimension one map. And you can ask, since all these spaces are non-singular, you can ask, uh, what is the normal bundle of this map? And if you understood what I said about the deformation theory, then you'll know what the normal bundle of this map is. The normal bundle of this map is exactly those directions which correspond to the smoothing of this node because all the others are already absorbed here on the left-hand side. So the normal bundle comes from exactly the, the deformations which smooth that node. And we have explained what those are. They're the tensor product of the two tangent lines. So these, these line bundles, these tangent line bundles are very useful in the geometry because they tell you, for example, what the normal bundles of these divisors are. Let's start. Okay. So those are the tangent lines and of course, uh, if I take their dual, I get the cotangent lines. So the so actually I'm getting a little bit of an echo. So maybe one could try to silence the microphone there. Okay, so if I take the dual of the tangent lines, I get the cotangent lines. That makes sense. And these are another way to say it is these are the this is the complex line bundle that's determined by the cotangent space at the ith point. And we'll use the more traditional notation. Instead of using this ti star, we'll just use li. That's more standard notation, the subject, the cotangent lines. And, and I would say that in, the, in geometry, uh, very often the cotangent lines are used instead of the tangent lines. And one of the reasons is that this is the first result is that this line bundle li, the cotangent line bundle is nef on the deline mumford moduli space. So this is the first geometric result about the cotangent line. And I thought I'd give uh, some kind of proof of it. So that the cotangent lines have some, some uh, positivity. That's this nefness. So if you don't remember what nef is, it means that if I intersect it with any curve, I get something that's uh, greater than or equal to zero. OK, so let, uh, so I want to give a proof of this nefness. And so let's start with uh, a uh, curve. So, let, so we're going we're gonna to take a curve, a test curve here. 
I take a one dimensional base B that's here. And I want to consider this B mapping to the moduli space of stable curves. And how do I arrange such a map? Well, this, this is more or less the same as giving a family of stable curves over, over this base B. And I have to then also give the sections, N sections, which give me the points. So if, if I have this family of uh, nodal curves over B with these N sections, such that uh, every fiber is a stable, uh, Deline Mumford stable curve, this gives me a map from B to MGN bar. So if I want to test the nefness, I have to prove some, some result about every one of these families. So let's start with one. So then of course we have to use something. And the positivity we use is that for, uh, for this moduli, we can look at this uh, space. The space is omega to the, it's the, um, yeah, so maybe I should put the K in another place here. It's the uh, dualizing sheaf twisted by these sections and I take the kth power of it. This gives me some, for high, for high K, this gives me some vector bundle on the base, this R zero pi lower star. And it's a, one of the basic results is that this bundle is semi-positive. And this has been explained, this is explained very nicely in this paper by uh, Janusz Kolar called Projectivity of Complete Moduli. That's a, that paper has a goal of trying to construct these moduli spaces without using GIT. You have to get positivity from somewhere without using GIT. And he gives you a, uh, a proof of this semi-positivity. Uh, so I, I recommend looking at it's in section 4.7. So we have to start with something. So this is some vector bundle at semi-positive, which means that at least it's of degree greater than or equal to zero. So if you look at um, growth and decrease on rock applied to this, you'll find that that implies that uh, the first churn class of this omega pi twisted by the sections, the square of that is greater than or equal to zero. The, the semi-positivity for this uh, K implies this result. That's by growth and degree Mon rock applied to that uh, surface. So this gives us something, this is our start. But this, it doesn't look like this has anything to do with the cotangent or tangent bundles, but it does by a kind of a clever idea. So we take, so we're, the, this whole proof is about, so here's this curly C, which is actually a surface. It's a surface because it's a family of curves over a one dimensional base that gives us a surface. So this whole proof is going to be about some intersection theory of this surface. So the first thing we've learned is this line, this, this first churn class of this particular line bundle, its square is greater than or equal to zero. Now the second, the second geometric step is if I take that same churn class and I multiply it by the class of the section, the sections give me some divisors in the surface, S1, S2, that's the locations of the mark points. If I take the intersection of this first churn class of the bundle that we've decided whose square is positive, we take that intersection with a section. The answer is that this is, this is um, exactly zero. And that's for geometric reasons. That when I take this, it's the degree of this dualizing sheaf on the section, and then also the degree of the section restricted to itself. There's no intersection of different sections for i not equal to j because the sections are distinct. That's one of the assumptions. So if I look at what this is, this is the cotangent line at the section, and this is the tangent line at the section. So we get geometrically that this intersection product is zero. All right, so what we have here is we have this self-intersection is uh, greater than or equal to zero, and the intersection of that line bundle with the section is exactly equal to zero. So so now we want to use the Hodge index theorem and one has to be a little concentrate a little bit when one uses it here. So the Hodge index theorem says on a surface, if I look at the narrow and severity group that I get the signature that's minus, that's plus one and then all minuses. That's the statement of the Hodge index theorem. And so 
if we go back up here, we can assume, suppose, oh, sorry, I'm not sure what happened. Suppose this was positive. So this is greater than or equal to zero. So suppose it was positive. Then it would eat up the plus in the Hodge index theorem. And moreover, this section is, is orthogonal to that uh, positive element. So it would have to be in the minus part. So if we had a positive there, then the section would have to be, the sum of the, the, the square of the section would have to be minus. And then if you go understand what the cotangent line is, it's actually equal to negative because this is the, this is the uh, tangent line. So this being minus means that this is plus. So that proves that uh, the uh, cotangent line intersects this curve positively, of course, but that may, may be not the case. And maybe this, we have a zero here. It could be that we have a zero. So we, we handled the plus here. The plus here gave us a minus there, which gave us a plus here. But it could be that we have a zero here. Then we have to see what happens. Well. So could we have a plus here? Have a positive, strictly positive. That would contradict the zero here because if this were strictly positive, then this class would have to be in the minus in the Hodge index, but it's zero. So the outcome of that, the outcome of this is that if you go through that logic carefully, that the fact that this is greater than or equal to zero, and the intersection with SI is zero, means that this SI squared is less than or equal to zero, and the intersection of the cotangent line is minus the SI squared, so that's greater than or equal to zero. So one of the puzzles in this proof is, could zero actually occur? And the answer is yes, it could occur. And that's a kind of question, look at reducible curves. Okay, so I hope that was understandable. Maybe one has to go through this logic oneself, but the steps are to use this uh, semi-positivity of r pi lower star, and then use the logic of the Hodge index theorem. And there's another wrinkle in this proof, which is that you might think, well, am I really using this? Am I legal? Is it legal to use the Hodge index theorem for these surfaces, which have many components and all that? And so you have to think about that yourself. You can take them apart and apply it to one, one component at a time if you have to. Okay, so that's the, that's the first geometric result. These cotangent lines, they're actually NEF, which is kind of a nice thing. So it gives you some some positive line bundles or you know, weakly positive line bundles in the modular space of curves. And the standard notation for the first Trin class is this psi. Psi i is the first Trin class of Li. Now, yep. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Could you repeat where the tangent and cotangent lines come into that proof? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Right, that was a little fast. So maybe I'll make a little, uh, some kind of new page. It might help if I know how to do that. So some, somehow I'm in the full screen. Okay, I'm, I have to understand how to do that. Okay, I, I could still I can explain it here. So we have this family of curves. That's the curly C over the base B. And we have these sections. Okay, so let's look at section one. So the first thing, one of the things that's coming here is the self-intersection of that section. That was one of the actors in this argument here. And if you ask, what is the self-intersection of a section? Geometrically, that's given by the churn class of the normal bundle of that section. And what's the normal bundle of the section? Normal in the section is the tangent space, the vertical tangent space. And what is that? When I take the normal bundle of the section and pull it back to B, that's the tangent line. So in some sense, you can say here that this intersection here is the intersection of the base with the first turn class of the tangent line at I. So it's the negative of the cotangent line. So that's one way where it comes. If you, have a, if you look at the section and you look at the self-intersection of the section that has to do with the normal bundle, and the normal bundle has to do with the tangent line. Another way that's coming in this, in this proof is that uh, if I look at this dualizing sheaf and I restrict it to the section, 
The dualizing sheaf to the section is everywhere the cotangent line. So we can say this is like the cotangent line and this is like the tangent line. Okay, I hope that helped. So there's uh, something slightly confusing here always about moduli is that in moduli space, we consider structures on the moduli space, but those structures give actually geometric structures on every family. And part of understanding this is how to translate the abstract structures in the moduli space to the specific uh, geometric structures on every family. All right, I hope that, that went some ways to answering that question. Rahul, we have a question in the Q&A. Uh, what kind of singularity can C have? You mean the curly C? I think the, the curly C, yeah. Yeah, so the curly C, I mean, the, every fiber has a nodal singularity. And the, 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 fa the, the kind of singularity C can have is something like X, Y minus T to the K, things like that. Because you can have some deformation of the node. You could have a smoothing of the node. In other ways, C can be singular as it could be, you know, it could just be like this, where you could, you know, it could just be a nodal curve. And then C could have two components. So that's also possible. That's also a different kind of singularity. So it can have this kind of smoothing of a node singularity, or it could have just, it could just preserve the components. The, the technical definition of C, I mean, we can take here B to be non-singular and the technical definition of C is it's a flat family of nodal curves over the base. So it can have any uh, singularities are allowed by a flat family of nodal curves over one dimensional base. And they're kind of two kinds. There's this kind, and then there's the one where the node is just preserved. So yeah, I mean, I didn't give every single detail in this argument. So if you look at the Hodge index theorem, that's normally stated for some non-singular uh, surface. So you have to make some, uh, you have to fiddle with that a little bit to put it in that. But you know, this is some, some technical moves, which are kind of standard. All right, so the standard notation here is that uh, this psi i is the first turn class of the cotangent line. This is completely standard in the subject. The psi i is the turn class of the cotangent line. And we have a forgetful map from MGN plus one to MGN, where we forget the last marking, and then you can define the kappa classes. And the kappa classes are given by taking the cohomological push forward of powers of the cotangent line. So these give us some classes in the moduli space of curves. And another basic geometric fact is if I take the Picard group of the moduli space of smooth curves, this is geometrically generated by this kappa class and the cotangent line. So again, you can't avoid these cotangent lines. I've given you many different ways to think about them and you can't avoid them. They're just basic aspects of the geometry. So nefness, that geometric nefness with the argument I gave you using the Hodge index theorem is that uh, by this geometric nefness, if I take the, the churn classes of the cotangent lines and raise them to powers, that the answer is always greater than or equal to zero. And that's because that's if you take Neff line bundles and you take their uh, powers, you always get uh, something greater or equal to zero. That's an aspect of Neffness. And of course, the integral vanishes unless we have the dimension constraint. We have to have the, uh, the um, dimension of the integrand to match the dimension of the moduli space, which I remind you is 3G minus 3 plus N. So if you're interested in these integrals of the cotangent lines, which we will be, then the one thing we know is they have to be uh, greater than or equal to zero. And uh, as I said, of course they vanish if, you're not, if you don't match the dimensions. But a, a question that emerges directly from the geometry is can these vanish if the dimension is correct? Like, can we actually have an actual honest intersection of cotangent lines, which is actually equal to zero? That's not ruled out by this Hodge index argument. And I, actually I don't know how to address this question, strictly speaking, geometrically. We'll give an answer to this, hopefully at the end of the lecture. And the answer is gonna be, uh, yes, it has to be strictly positive, but this nefness doesn't uh, quite imply it. And as I said, that it's not, if you, when one wants to understand this, it's good to find loci where this cotangent line um, is, is trivial and you can find that. Like an example is if I look at, um, G1 
And if I look at the locus, okay, maybe let's let's do it mg2. If I look at the locus where the two points bubble off, so this is a genus G curve and the two points are on a M03 bubble. Then this gives me a big, it's gives a divisor in fact here. That's kind of the divide, one of the divisors I explained before, but it gives a divisor in MG2. And if I look at how the cotangent line at one of these mark points behaves, it's just trivial because it's uh, this cotangent line is the cotangent line of this mark point on this M03, so nothing is moving. So this is a pretty large locus where the cotangent line is trivial which is okay for somebody who's NEF. But one, as I said, this, this, this leaves this question is that, can, can we take away this or not? So, so, I, so far I've been giving a lecture about kind of elementary aspects of the geometry. And it's true that I skipped many steps and it's good to think about all of the things I'm saying. So it's not a bad idea if you want to understand the subject to one, to do that X calculation I explained at the beginning completely honestly till you believe the canonical correspondence with the tangent lines. The second is to go through this Hodge index uh, theorem argument and do it completely honestly uh, in terms of the components and singularities. And then after that, you'll come to this point where you think about these cotangent lines and, and there's various ways, classical ways to try to compute these intersections. But then now comes a leap in the subject where I'm gonna tell you how to compute these intersections. And this is, this is something that's very non-trivial and it's, uh, it was uh, some developments that happened now quite a long time ago. So this is when more or less I was in graduate school. So it's in the early nineties and that's Witten's conjecture. And, and Witten tells you that is conjecture how to compute this. How to compute. these intersections. And to explain the form of the conjecture that he wrote, uh, I will switch to his notations, which is this notations of the descendant insertions, that's these taus and the bracket. And that's very simple notation. It says, if I write this bracket and this uh, tau insertions, then this is just equal to this intersection of these cotangent lines. So when I see a kappa one, a K one an exponent that goes as a tau k. So somehow tau j corresponds to some point to the j. This notation is kind of nice because it, uh, it, it uh, captures the symmetries of the integrals here, the basic symmetry, the SN symmetries. You don't have to really write all of the subscripts. So they've been taken out here. And this genus here tells you what genus is. This n tells you how many points, but it's kind of redundant because you can just look at how many points there are here. So that's often dropped. And the uh, reason he writes it like this is because this is uh, viewed as some insertions in some uh, quantum, quantum theory. So as I said, that this thing is zero if uh, the dimension constraint is not satisfied. And it's also zero if we have some we're not in stable curves. But for the most part, as long as you're not violating the dimension constraint, then this is geometrically well-defined. All right, so to state Witten's conjecture, we form a generating series. So that's, we fix the, well, to start, we fix the genus and the generating series has some variables and there's one variable for, for every uh, non-negative integer, that's this zero, one, two. And these, these variables will correspond, I mean, they're index, these variables index these tau insertions. So there's a one variable, so to speak, for every tau insertion. And it's kind of exponential generating series. So it's a definition as you sum over all sequences of non-negative integers with only finally many non-zero terms. For every one of these sequences, you get some bracket here. And you put the generating series, the variables in, uh, in this way, which is kind of exponential way. And as I, I remind you that this bracket is this integral that we're interested in. You can write this more efficiently or you can just write this just on the face of it as exponential where you view this uh, field phi is formally all of the tau's with uh, the variables ti. 
So that's a more efficient way to write it. But nevertheless, so that's a, you can convince yourself that this uh, series has coefficients which exhaust all of the integrals, all of the descendant integrals that we're interested in, all of these integrals. Where did they go? Here, they have all of these integrals appear and nobody else appears. So in some sense, this generating series is exactly the generating series of these cotangent line integrals. Okay, so, um, so that's so far nothing's happened. I've just uh, written down the series which, which carries these uh, integrals and we can put all of the data uh, for all the genera together. And then we need an extra variable for that. That's this lambda. So now we have this T. So this T stands for this sequence of variables, T0, T1, T2. And if we put all the genera together, we need another variable which keeps track of, which keeps track of the genus. And that's this lambda. So we have F lambda T. And uh, for the genus zero, one has to be just a little careful because there are some that don't make it, for, from our point of view, that don't make any sense. We don't consider a genus zero with one and two points since these are unstable configurations. So those, very, those integrals, if they appear here, are just set to zero. This was already said somehow in these, uh, it was said somehow here that also is zero if 2g minus 2 plus n is less than or equal to zero. Okay, so we can put all of this data together and we get this, this uh, function f. And the, then there's the notation for partial derivatives, which is kind of uh, very natural in this notation, which is that if I put double brackets, that means I take partial derivatives with respect to the variables associated to those tau's. Okay. So then Witten's conjecture, which was proven also in the 90s by Kinsevich, so soon afterwards actually, is the uh, is this uh, series of differential equations. This is written in this KDV form, and it says that for every n greater than or equal to one, we get an equation, and this equation. Well, it's about these derivatives of f. So this is some non-trivial equation. And whatever it is, it must be saying something about the cotangent line integrals because f is just made of, its coefficients are just the cotangent line integrals. But so Witten gives you an infinite sequence of integers and this, this infinite, infinite sequence of integers is related to this KDV hierarchy. And I wanted to explain at least one origins of that. And this, it's just extremely explicit thing here. I think I've by now explained all aspects of the notation. So if we look at the first one, it's standard here to that let u be the second derivative of f with respect to t naught. And then the very first equation, if you just patiently write it, it comes in this form that partial u partial t1 is u partial u t naught. And you get this cubic term here at the end. I set lambda equals to one. And this is exactly the, this KDV equation. And it's uh, mathematical origins. That's the very first one. That's the n equals one equation here. This gives, this is the KDV equation. It's mathematical origin comes from uh, the study of shallow water waves. And this appears in the 19th century to describe some uh, uh, persistent waves on channels in, in the Netherlands. And here I tried to give you the dictionary that this, this tau zero is the spatial coordinate, T1 is the time coordinate, and U here is the height of the wave. And it's a very natural question to ask, like what, what are waves? I mean, what is this? How is it that uh, we have these shallow water waves coming onto the moduli space of curves? That's, a, that's kind of a, an amazing thing. Okay, so I'm gonna say a few words about that, but not many. But so I would just like to say what I've done here, what, what actually Witten has done, which the Witten conjectures is that we take these cotangent line integrals, we associate a generating function. This is this free energy. And uh, then it happens that uh, they satisfy this amazing sequence, infinite sequence of, of partial differential equations that uh, the first one is the classical KDV equation and the, and the higher ones are this KDV hierarchy. And so this, it's a natural question to ask, what do water waves have to do with MGN bar? 
And this is a long and interesting story. And uh, I recommend that if you want to, to read about it, that this is paper of Witten, this is around 1990, maybe 89 or something like that, but well into the past century, which is 2, 2D quantum gravity and intersection theory in moduli space. And the roughly the, uh, this kind of uh, high level outline of what happens there is that uh, there are, so there's a, a theory of integral systems and matrix integrals, the integrals over spaces of Hermitian matrices. And what uh, Witten, the connection Witten makes in that paper is that one way to think about these matrix integrals is mathematically analyze them. And it was known before Witten that such matrix integrals, their generating series give rise, well, give rise to some functions that satisfy the KDV equation. That's a theory of integral systems. But the really new connection that's made there is that Witten gives some geometric way of thinking about the same, the, the matrix integrals in terms of what he calls 2D gravity, which is some integral over all Riemann surfaces. And when he tries to identify what the specific integrals are, what they should correspond to in the 2D gravity, he gets exactly these cotangent lines. So if you believe these, these leaps here, that the, this theory of integrals over the uh, cotangent lines can be written in explicitly in terms of some matrix integrals, then there's a second leap of those matrix integrals are connected to KDV equations. And this was proven just shortly afterwards by Kinsevich, and he does, he does exactly write these cotangent lines in terms of matrix integrals, slightly different matrix integrals. That's it's called Kinsevich's matrix model. But essentially goes by this path. But that's an amazing story. And uh, if you want to look at uh, the, the first pass through it, I recommend uh, reading uh, this paper of Witten's or these parts of it. So the very, that was the very first pass. The second pass goes through Hurwitz numbers. And there's different ways to go through Hurwitz numbers. And I'm not going to explain that uh, here so much, but the, the, the results can also be proven um, uh, using uh, Hurwitz numbers instead of this matrix angles and KDV equations, you use uh, relate the cotangent lines to Hurwitz numbers and then use some properties of the Hurwitz numbers to show that they satisfy uh, these, uh, these equations. Actually, you can use them to prove the various matrix models also exist by the Hurwitz numbers methods. And then there's the, actually, I think that in some sense, the algebraically simplest approach, if you want to, like the opposite of the beginning, if you want to look at the, the simplest uh, path, I recommend this paper by Kazarian Lando in 2006. But, uh, but anyway, those are three things. If you want to, to learn a little bit more about this, you can read the witness paper, or you can read this paper I wrote with Andrei Okonkov on Gromov Witten theory, Hurwitz numbers, and matrix models, but you have to like Hurwitz numbers for that. And the most efficient proof, also, also using the kind of Hurwitz number path we take, is by Kazarian Lando, 2006. Okay, that gives us some clues. And the question is can we calculate? So that's kind of this infinite sequence of equations. Can we actually use them? And I wanted to give, and the answer is yes. And here I wanted to give a very, the very first example, which is this tau one in genus one, that's the integral of psi one over m11. So m11 is uh, the space of elliptic curves with one point. And you know, this space is uh, uh, one dimensional. And normally it's given by, you know, some region like this quotient by SL2. But here we take the compactification. So it's one dimensional algebraic variety or Deline Mumford stack. And then it has one point and I can take the cotangent line. And so in some sense, this is the first uh, high, in a, there's the whole gene of zero story, but this is the first kind of non, uh, non gene of zero integral to think about. It's a kind of interesting one. And you can ask does how to calculate the value of this using this, uh, this set of equations. And if, when you first try it, it doesn't seem to work so well. So I want to just say, show what happens. So first you have to decide which equation to pick. So I tell you pick n equals three. And then if you write this n equals three equation and you set lambda equal to one and, and all the ti is equal to zero, you set these after the differentiation, of course, then you get this equation. 
So that has some genus one on this side, some genus one on that side, some genus zero, genus zero, and it has lots of tau zeros and it doesn't look like it's actually helping us too much. But uh, there is an equation that then helps us. It's called the string equation. The string equation tells you how to remove tau zero. It's a very easy equation and I, I, it's on the next slide. But what it does is it tells you how, when you have a bracket, how to remove a tau zero. And it says more or less, I take this tau zero, I remove it and I bump this down and I get the tau one. And I, I said the string equation, I, I wrote it on the next slide, but the, the string equation tells you how to remove this tau zero. And it simple, lets you simplify this, this equation that has come straight from the KDV equations. And if you apply those, uh, if you apply the string equation to simplification, then you find this very nice equation. And this very nice equation you can solve. And you get this uh, rather well-known result, which is the, the first Chern class of the cotangent line in M11 has a degree one over 24. And so this already shows that in the subject, the orbifold nature uh, have, plays a kind of decisive role. There's fractions everywhere. And the, the reason that this fraction is because the moduli space M11 is not, uh, the right way to view that moduli space is an orbifold, not as a space. And it's these automorphisms that are giving you this one over 24. So the string equation, what is that? So here's the rule for the string equation. It says that if I have a tau zero and I want to remove it from the bracket, I just remove it. And then I go through everybody else in the bracket and I lower them by one. I sum over the choice of who I lower by one and then I lower that person by one. So that's the rule. And you can look at that rule and I've applied it several times here. So you can go look. So here there was a tau zero and I, and I lower, there's only one person to lower because I can't lower zero to negative one. So I lower this three by one, then by one and I lower here. So you, you have to just play with it. More interesting question is why is the string equation true? And uh, I gave a whole proof of it here. Maybe I, I don't go through the proof now, but the proof is a, a proof using just the geometry of the moduli space of curves. It's a different level of complexity, meaning that the string equation geometrically is very, very simple. This equation, there, I said, there's various approaches to them. None of them are very simple. This equation is, is some kind of very deep mathematical equation. The string equation's not. It's an easy one. So I actually gave the whole proof here, but I, I don't want to give it now. You can read it yourself, or maybe you can discuss it in the problem sessions. It's one of, the, uh, one of the parts of the subject, if one wants to understand how Witten's equation work, it's good to have a good mathematical, mathematical knowledge of the string equation. And uh, I think I will skip these two, places, two slides. It's just a calculation. And I did it kind of carefully here and you can look at it. So, so now some exercises, use the string equation to, to calculate the genus zero. Uh, descendant integrals. That's all the descendant integrals over the moduli spaces of genus zero curves. They're easy and they're given by this multinomial coefficient. And to prove that, all you need to know is the string equation and one, some initial condition that's easy. And while we're talking about that, there's another rule, which is uh, how to remove the tau one. So in this bracket, there are two things that are easy geometrically. It's to remove, if you see a tau zero, you can remove it, or you can take a tau one, you can remove it. And by remove it, I mean, you can express it as a sequence of, as, a, as maybe a sum, like in this case, a sum, or just one descendant integral where that insertion has been removed. It's a geometric rule. And these are the, the two standard ones are the string equation, whose proof I've skipped. And then there's the dilaton equation for tau one. And uh, I didn't even give the proof here, but it's proven in the exact same way. If you understand the proof of the string equation, you can also prove the dilaton equation. And these are very useful, simple rules. You know, that uh, it just tells you if you see a bracket, how to remove a tau zero and a tau one. And these, these rules are very appealing. In some sense, they are a bit nicer than this kind of gymnastics I had to do for the KDV where I have to look at the integral and I have to digest this. And I find that the particular fellow that I'm interested in appears on both sides of the equation. And whenever you have something appearing on both sides of the equation, 
you might wonder like, what if this had the coefficient which canceled that and then vanished? That would be disappointing. So this is a more intricate uh, uh, analysis, although it always works. It's not the case that the coefficient, it's not, it's not the case that the equation runs away from you. But it might be nice to hope for generalizations of these very simple equations, the, the string equation and the dilaton equation. That'd be an equation that directly tells you how to remove a tau k. And that line of discussion is a very profitable line of discussion. And it's actually kind of the, um, one of the themes that are run through the series of lectures. And that has to do with the Virasara constraints. So uh, the mathematical statement is that if you know the KDV equation and you know the string equation, that determines all of the descendant integrals. But an easier way to deter determine them conceptually is from the Virasara constraints. And that's what I wanted to end this lecture with. So we come back to this generating series for all descendant integrals that was in Witten's conjectures. And then I can take the exponential of it and get this partition function z. So in, in terms of keeping track of the descendant integrals, there's no damage or benefit for doing the exponential. They're still there and you can get back by the logarithm. But this has some meaning. This f is for the free energy and the z is for the partition function. So the string and so then one can write this string and dilaton equations, the ones that I said are rather direct geometric equations. Uh, you can write them very nicely in terms of differential operators, and I've written them here. This can these formulas can already be already be found in Witten's paper in 1990. And then the statement of the string and dilaton equations are that uh, if I take this L minus one operator and this L zero operator, it annihilates this uh, partition function. This is, this is just logically equivalent. These two equations are just logically equivalent to what I call the string and dilaton equation with one more input, some initial condition. The initial condition is one here and this initial condition one over 24. And that initial condition makes its way to this 1 16th. So anyway, what I'm, what I'm saying is that if you geometrically derive the string and dilaton equation in the form I said, then that, and you know these two initial conditions, then that's logically equivalent to these two differential operators annihilating Z. And if you have these differential operators, it makes sense to calculate their bracket. And it turns out their bracket is, is, gives you back L minus one. You know, since these differential operators annihilate Z, their bracket also annihilates Z. So it would have been nice if it gave you something different. But, and this can remind one if, you're, if you think about these things, the, if I look at, holomorphic differential operators in the variable u. This is usually the variable z, but I already have so many z's, I switched to u. If I look at holomorphic differential operators in the variable u, that's given in this form. Curly L n is minus, is negative u to the L n plus one partial partial u. So these are some uh, differential operators on the line and they satisfy this Virasar bracket. And if you go look what we have here, is uh, a um, beginning of a representation of this algebra. If we, we can make this curly minus one goes to L1, curly minus curly zero goes to L0. It's a beginning of a representation of this algebra of uh, holomorphic differential operators in the variable U. And uh, the uh, line, which could be considered at this point, just like a flight of fancy is that maybe we can extend this uh, representation to every K, but goes to what? And we have some clues because there's the, there's the Witten, and, and of course, then we'd want to have this anni annihilation property. So one has some clues, some roadmaps. 
But uh, the answer is the following. For every positive n, so that gives the L1, L2, L, so on, you define this differential operator. OK? And as I said, that you, know, you, you could ask, where is this formula coming from? And as I said, that there are some clues. If you ask to find a differential operator that has, uh, well, you have to constrain, so to speak, what terms will occur here. So if you, if you know ahead of time, it's just these terms. And there's some good reasons to know ahead of time it's those terms. It's, it's a good guess to make anyway. And moreover, you want to impose this bracket. It really, it really constrains the coefficients. And, and my, my memory is it basically uniquely constrains the coefficients up to some, maybe some scale, or maybe not even. But uh, anyway, what I'm trying to say is that if you decide that you're going to try to find, extend this representation in, in terms of these different differential operators, you constrain the orders that you see, uh, that basically constrains the possible answer. I mean, it's an overdetermined system, so you expect none, but actually there's this guy. That's kind of a beautiful thing. And uh, then you can just check algebraically, like once someone has written the formula for you to check that it satisfies this virus R bracket is just some mechanical check, which I invite you to do. And the virus R constraints then take the form that these, uh, these differential operators ln annihilate this partition function for all n greater than minus one. So it includes the string, the dilaton, and then all of these higher ones. And if you look at what's going on here, if you, if, if you can understand what this means, what it means for this operator to annihilate z, this partial partial tau, tau n, it gives you a rule for removing tau n plus one. Just like this, the string, this minus one gave a rule for removing tau zero. This gave a rule for removing tau one. This, this uh, annihilation, this ln annihilating z gives a rule for removing tau n plus one. That, and, and that this, this is zero, so this goes to the other side of the equation. And then if you see what happens to all these terms, they're somehow lower. And what happens magically in this equation is that all these terms are positive. This, there's one negative coefficient, that's this initial coefficient. And all of these other terms, the recursive terms are positive. So what that means is that this actually proves that these descendant integrals are always strictly positive whenever. So I actually don't know a geometric proof of this. This is a, but the, this proof from this Virasara formulation proves that they're all strictly positive. And if you want to, to to see what's happening here, I invite you to compute this. So you could say, what, what's the proof? So there's two paths to the proof. The first path is this, this KDV plus string equation actually implies the Virasara constraint. So it's algebraically. And this was uh, a version of this is in a paper by Dijkraff for Linden Verlinden in 1991, meaning that algebraically this already implies it. I mean, it's kind of slightly non-trivial, but it implies it algebraically. Uh, a more geometric path, which is kind of beautiful is uh, hyperbolic geometry this is Mir Mirzakhani. So Mirzakhani shows that uh, if you study uh, bounded Riemann surfaces and you can you look at the volumes of these uh, Riemann, Riemann surfaces with boundary, then she has two ideas there. One is that you can express the, uh, the volumes in terms of uh, descendant integrals. And the second is that she has a recursive relation for the volumes using some decomposition in geodesics. And if you connect her path, it, you get a, it's, a, it's amazing, but then you get exactly the virus hour constraint. So that's maybe the more direct way. So there's two different paths. Okay, so I'm going to stop. So this corollary is for the disconnected uh, integers, right? What's the corollary? I mean, they're, they're, they are positive, right? No, this is the connected ones. Ah. I mean, I'm not sure it makes much difference, but.
when you take a log, so there are some signs, right? <laughs> no, but you make the you make the connected ones out of the disconnected ones. So you make the disconnected ones out of the connected ones. But yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm. What I've written here is for connected integrals. integrals. Any other question? So I had a, a naive question. You, what is the space of the representation? Power series in the t variable? It's uh no, it's differential operators and it's like the space of differential operators in infinitely many variables. Because we have that's this. That's where the ln. Yeah, the lns live in some differential operators on all these variables. Okay, infinitely the many variables. But but they're, they're not just they're differential operators. Actually, they have polynomial coefficients. I mean, you can constrain it a little bit, but that's what we're talking about. I see. And what's I, the structure of the representation itself abstractly? Is it cyclic? Or? I mean, it's a, I think it just gives you an also, uh, yeah, I mean, the whole, uh, you know. So, uh, I mean, I, this thing is just an isomorphism that, uh, you know, this, this, uh, this uh, algebra of holomorphic differential operators is just isomorphic to this one. But you're asking about how this acts on the all of differential operators. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. So we have some some questions in the Q and A. Uh, would you like me to read them to you, or would you like to take them? Well, um, I can't see the Q and Q and A, so maybe right. it's better if you read it to me. Not a problem. The first one is: Is it proved that the intersection numbers of psi classes belong to Q? Uh, yeah. So they they belong to Q because that's. That's because they are, uh, so that, that has to do with the intersection theory. They're actually integral classes on the stack and that gives you Q classes in numbers. But that's because they're actually line bundles. They're actually line bundles on the stack. So it's churn classes will give you some uh, classes. They're integral classes on the stack. And when you, I mean, they're Z valued classes on the stack. And then when you integrate them, you get some rational numbers because that's how the rules of orbifolds work. So the answer the is yes. Question, the next question is for the Virasoro constraints, is there a deformation of these differential operators that gives non-zero central charge in the Virasoro? Yeah, if this is, is yeah, it's a, you know, yeah, I mean, there's, that's right. This is only somehow half of the Virasoro and how to put the other ones in, in this context, it's not so clear because we don't have some negative descendants. In other contexts, there's been some playing with it, but uh, I don't know how to put it in here. The, the rest of the Virasoro. So we have a couple of more questions about the Virasoro constraints. So one of them is, would they be equivalent to what in physics is the condition of the states being physical? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the last one on Virasoro constraints is, Virasoro constraints mean, mean that Z is the highest weight vector for the vacuum module. Is there a similar interpretation for non-vacuum highest vectors? Maybe this was related to the other question we had about what the full representation is. Yeah. I don't know. Okay, there are no further questions, then let's thank Raul again.